Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, a longtime friend of mine, somebody I've known since he was five years old, grew up in the same neighborhood as I did in Alexandria. And he is an ACPS graduate. Um, I think he graduated in 1983. Um, his name is Chris Quinn. And today he's a, a professional uh, documentary filmmaker. Um, and I'm also introducing um, a colleague of his who graduated in 2011, Hannah Worker, who was also, they were both TV production students here. Actually, Chris was here before the class was actually called TV production, but they both um, worked, kind of start, kind of started their careers at TC. Um, so um, Chris, uh, among other projects, has done two feature length documentary films. Um, the first one, um, was called God Grew Tired of Us, and it's about um, several Sudanese lost boys who came to New York. They were refugees. They came to New York. And it's about their transition into the country. Um, it premiered, I believe it premiered at, Sunday, at the Sundance Film Festival, which is one of the premier film festivals in the world, and it won the two main documentary uh, awards that year. Um, he's just finished another film called Eating Animals, which, which is about, as I, as I understand it, it hadn't been released yet. Um, it, it, it's about um, the movement in this country from traditional farming of animals to kind of an industrial system, you know, where there's like thousands of pigs kind of cramped together in cages and things. Anyway, I don't know that much about it, but it sounds like a really interesting film. And it just, it just uh, premiered at the Telluride Film Festival, which is another huge festival. Uh, the Telluride Film Festival does not give awards, so it didn't get any awards, but it got it got high praise. Um, <clears throat> so I want to tell you a little bit background about Chris. You know, Chris had a, an older brother and sister, and they were they were um, kind of traditionally academically inclined kids. And Chris was a little bit of the black sheep. He was not as as focused on the traditional academics, but he was very creative. And I think that he was really he really benefited from um, going to the Alexandria City Public Schools. A lot of you are in um, you know, uh, creative electives. And um, when Chris went here, um, there, was a, there was a speech class. And he'll, he'll tell you a little bit more about this. But the speech class um, had a little segment. A third quarter, they worked, on, they worked on making films with Super 8, with old film um, cameras. And, and we were laughing about it earlier. But he'll tell you more about exactly how that process worked. Um, but, you know, it gave him a start. And I think that today, despite the fact that, um, that there's a lot of testing going on and a lot of focus on data, um, there's still a big fo focus in Alexandria on, uh, on the arts, on creativity. And I think that's a great thing. And, and I think that it helped a lot of people. You're going to have a chance to, talk, to ask questions of Chris. And one thing you might ask him is about some of his friends, because he's got a lot of friends who also went into creative fields actors and, and other um, filmmakers, um, ad execs. Anyway, there's a lot of people that came out of TC who have gone into some really interesting fields. Um, and Chris also, um, I knew his family, and his parents were very supportive of him, and that helped as well. They let him kind of do his own thing. They let, let him make his own decisions, and I think that's really important. Um, the last thing I want to say is that, you know, Chris had these opportunities, um, but, you know, a big um, reason why he was so successful is he also worked really hard and he would he persevered. I think in fields like his, you know, you don't just you don't just have success the first time you try something. You keep doing it and you keep doing it until you get until you get it down. Um, um, so, you know, he 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 continued to pursue his dream. He knew what he wanted to do and 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 it worked out. So anyway, without any more um, intro. Let me bring out Christopher Dylan Quinn and Hannah Worker. Thanks for that nice introduction. Hi, how are you guys? Let me share the podium here with Hannah. Hannah and I are both graduates, as uh, I think Taki said, of T.C. Williams. Uh, well, we didn't, it wasn't called TV. It was called speech for some strange reason, because all we did in speech was really make films. I think we spent most of our time, 80 or 90 percent of the time, making it. Uh, but it was something that was groundbreaking for me and all of my friends. We ended up 
dumping all of our energy and time into making films and we would you know work like I'm sure you guys do it's the crew on one you know friend's film and then you know somebody would get into the director's seat we had great fun doing it and that's kind of what set the wheels in motion for my career it's kind of the early uh, the early beginning and I was so into I, what now you know now I'm a documentary filmmaker but I was into journalism and also filmmaking I combined the two right after uh, going to TC I um, started at getting a journalism major uh, and worked at CBS in, in uh, DC for a year and a half and gained some college credit points doing that but then set the I started making films and just kept making films and there were a lot of failures that happened along the way but you kind of if, if it's in you you just kind of keep going and making them and eventually I got to New York City where I spent a good 10 years working from everybody from National Geographic to New York Times to Discovery to MTV and I started creating shows uh, for networks and so I made you know MTV shows but I would always have a project of my own while I was doing it so at night I'd get back and I would hatch plans on how I was going to get to a sub-Saharan Africa to make um, God Grew Tired of Us, which you'll uh, see in just a second. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you just hold the mic? Ah, uh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, you can just hold the mic. Yeah. All right. Ah, just yeah. hold it. Because there's two of them. Okay. Is that good? There you go. Okay. There we go. Is that better? It's coming through... Here, I can do this. Do you want to just... There we go. Exciting live television production. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is plenty. Yeah, so just hold it and then... Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, I had my day job and it kept me, I was working and doing a lot of fun creative things and at the same time I was doing my own projects which I really think is a great recipe because you're going to have to earn a living. And uh, so eventually I was trying, like I was mentioning earlier, I was trying to figure out how I was going to get to the middle of Africa to make this film when I raised a little bit of money uh, and found myself in a refugee camp, 90,000 people on the border of Kenya and Sudan. There was a war that was happening in Sudan at the time. It was very volatile and uh, unselling. But we went in, I took a small skeleton crew, probably four people, and we ended up uh, spending about eight days meeting people and learn their stories. And from that, we started to develop a, a documentary uh, that took about three to four years to make, I all told. Um, we can roll a maybe section of the film. I think you, it's the trailer that uh, Sony put together when it came out in the theaters. But you, you can take a look at it, and we can talk a little bit more about it. So tomorrow, we shall move here up to New York, my place. Hey, very tiny. Imagine a world far more complicated. 23 is your apartment, so all this for you. Than any you've ever known. I've never used electricity, so I imagine that it is really very hard for me to do that. Ever seen. These are donuts. Want to taste it? ever dreamed of. A radio alarm clock is one of the most important things because as I say in America, time is money. In Fish Africa, it. we call it Coca-Cola. Coca How are we going to be acquainted with this life here? New Market Films presents.
a remarkable true story of hope and inspiration. The Lost Boys arrived to America after walking a thousand miles through the wilderness of Africa to escape their country's bloody civil war. They had passed through a world without food or water. They had survived attacks by lions and hyenas. And they had survived the bombing raids of the northern Arab government, who wanted to see them finished off. I thought God got tired of us. So anyway, that was Gagar tired of us. Oh, thanks. Um, and uh, from there, I was able to, you know, kind of make more films. One of which we just finished. Hannah, uh, funnily enough, I was in my office in Los Angeles, and uh, a mutual friend introduced Hannah to me, who was a TC alum, and said wanted to ask some questions. You were going to college in uh, in, in neighboring Pomona, and. Uh, came uh, onto the studio lot. It's uh, old, you know, uh, what you would typically see. In, in, and we had lunch and we talked about things, about getting into the business and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, I think a day later, you, you had sent me a letter on why she should be working uh, for my company. And, and it was very Im uh, impressive. Anyway, so she came on as originally as an intern and then has migrated all the way to being one of the editors on the film. So it was a uh, kind of a, I would say, a very fast yeah. track. <laughs> you, normally it takes about 10 years to get to where you're, where you're going, and she did it in, in, a, in three. So, uh, well, you speak to a little bit about Eating Animals is the film that Taki had mentioned went to Tell You Ride, um, and I produced it with Natalie Portman, who bought the book. It's a best-selling book, and she came to me to make the, uh, adapt the book into a documentary, and we just finished it uh, and went to tell you right but you want to speak to that sure uh, just to give a little background I graduated from TC in 2011 uh, and did the TV productions program but when I was here we had just started TV3 so there had only been two years and then our year was the first year of TV3 and there was two of us so it's gotten much larger since uh, since I graduated but um, so after TC, I went to school, and then about halfway through, I met Christopher and hopped on this project, Eating Animals. Uh, and it's been a long labor of love. It's uh, been, a, it's been a, a small group of people who are very dedicated and, um, yeah, do you want to speak more to it? Well, I mean, I, I guess that speaks to the moment. It's like when you have a project and it gets, for me at least, when it gets under my skin and I can't not not do it I you 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 have to kind of develop this persistence to just keep because there's most of the days are kind of pushing against the project even being made whether it's financial or you have to get you know to India and how are you going to do that and there's all these things that are kind of near impossibilities and you have to figure out ways and, and in a lot of ways trick yourself that you're going to be able to get to the next day but it's all worth it in the end when the film comes out uh, and you actually get to premiere it. And, you know, like we were lucky enough at Telluride people, we got a standing ovation, which really meant a lot at, you know, after four years of work to have a, you know, you know, hundreds of people get up and, and appreciate your film. So some of those things, um, you know, with uh, with with whatever you guys go into and I hope you do my my you know ragtag crew at TC that was the old TC before they knocked it down but we just we all ended up in one sh form or another you know being in in uh, television or film and you know I have fr my 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 close friends a lot of them became actors and whether they were on TV shows or you know we we just we never let go of this idea that kind of was seated here in TC Williams 
and we all kind of went to college, but we all, you know, ended up, you know, really producing uh, television and film. So, and it's really thanks to T.C. Williams for at least offering that. So a lot of places don't even offer it. And that was kind of, for me, you know, the everything, as Taki was saying, I, 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 I didn't follow kind of my brother and sister's footsteps and I was, I was looking for something different and I found it at TC, so, and it really sparked a lot of things for me. I don't know, you might want to speak to. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same exact way and I think one of what you said earlier of when you're young and you're first kind of learning and figuring things out, how important it is to make mistakes, but just to be making things and just even if it's really bad and you don't like it or, you know, just to be making things. And that was something, at least when I was in TV production, was so cultivated. And I'm sure you guys have to do the same thing. It's like you're constantly making them and making them and working with each other. And for me too, it's the, the community, which now, you know, making eating animals has been so incredibly important, but was really started at TC and just matters so much if you're going into film and media. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 th I think that's it. I mean, you also, if you have an idea and you challenge your ideas on days when you have that and you're like, this is a really bad idea. And it, you, like, you, you have to kind of always be your best champion and find ways of getting it done. And people will tell you, like with God Grew Tired of Us, I tried to sell that film for two years to everybody from HBO and, you know, the doors constantly were being shut. And I finished the film by myself and then ended up at Sundance where it really just kind of, you know, we got there and it, it was, everybody really loved the film there and it became this big thing. And those companies that shut the door on me all were coming back, now wanting the film and, and buying, which is to say that you, if you really have an idea that you believe in, don't let anyone dissuade you because more than likely you know it's a good idea. And it's just having that persistence to stick through all the dark days of making a film. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge. There's no way of getting around it. It's a really challenging thing to make film or television. It's a lot of hours and a lot of persistence. But it, the reward is really fantastic, I would say. I don't know. We have, do we have a clip of eating animals? Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. You could, why don't you set the clip up? So this, uh, this clip is one of our main people in the film, Eating Animals, uh, and he raises turkeys, heritage turkeys, uh, out on a farm in Kansas. And so this is Frank Reese talking a little bit about the history of what's happened with uh, raising poultry in the U.S. You have to start thinking like a turkey and realize what they're going to do next and also sort of learn their language. I mean, turkeys are always talking. They have a tremendous language of their own and many, many different vocalizations that mean different things. So that's part of the reason why Ben Franklin didn't want the eagle. He thought the wild turkey was a far more majestic honorable animal. People think turkeys as being stupid and you know drowned in the rain, all this stuff, which isn't true. That all got base where people went out and bought baby turkeys and brought them home and didn't properly house them and it rained and they all drowned. But my response to that is take a human baby and put it out in a rainstorm and see how long it, it survives. It'll put its head up and drown. Um, you know, that had more to do with just really bad care. Now, the other side of it is that the modern industrial turkey that everybody buys at Thanksgiving is a lot stupider. But that's because man, when they've decided to take the turkey off the land and house them in buildings, actually began to select for stupidity. Because if you have an animal that you don't want it to do anything, you want to just eat and stand there, and gain weight, you don't want it to have any intelligence. <laughs> they like to be where the action is. So I, you saw the nice part of it. 
clearly we went into the industrial models, which are, you know, if you saw turkeys being raised in the industrial model, there are 15,000 birds in one long, you know, 500 foot structure and they're all suffering and it's a, so it looks at a, the, it was an investigative uh, look into how our meat is being raised and uh, what the conditions are for, you know, getting cheap meat to be put on your plate. Um, so anyway, that was the, 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 the film comes out, we just sold it, it's going to go to theaters 2018, so kind of somewhere springtime 2018, um, so we're really excited about that, yeah. Um, do we is, is, ask uh, questions? Is that yeah? Does anybody have any questions? I don't know if we covered anything or yes. What I guess like led you to want to cover the story eating animals? Well, it, it, again, it was, uh, so the, the author, Jonathan Sathron Four, it was his first nonfiction book. He had been successful at, uh, you know, uh, writing novels, and um, he wrote the book, and it really influenced Natalie Portman, who read the book, and she became a, veg a vegan from it. Uh, she stopped eating meat and dairy altogether after reading it, and bought the book and wanted to make it into a film. Uh, and John, she became a producing partner with Jonathan, and then they came to me. So actually, it was really funny because I, I, I remember, uh, I kind of only I take projects on and not that often because they're so hard to do these long, you know, uh, long form feature lengths. And uh, I was like, I think there's enough about food out there, and I was, you know, <laughs> but they sent me the book and I started reading it. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know anything about where my food comes from. And it was that kind of alarming moment where. 30 or 40 pages in, I was like, I have to make this film. And so I flew out. I was at the time living in Los Angeles, and I m went and met them in New York, and we started to talk about how we were going to make it into the film. And we, it was a great round table, and we just got very excited about it. So that was kind of, at first I was like, meh. And uh, it turned out to be one of the, you know, more transformative things that I've done. But um, yeah, it was a great experience. I don't know, you want to speak? Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think the other great challenge with this film, and you kind of touched on this, is that there's so many food documentaries that have come out that everyone, I'm sure, has completely ignored because you kind of expect, you kind of know what it is. Uh, but I think the great challenge was to make something that was a little bit different, took a, uh, like a different perspective on things. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you can. I, I think you can watch the film whether you don't want to give up because I was a big meat eater when they came to me, and I also said, you know, I don't want to give up, you know, eating. It. And that kind of process, you know, going through it, I was very mindful. I didn't want to wag my finger and tell people not to eat meat, or I just wanted to show how debilitating and how the whole effect of industrializing our food has rusted America. So the middle belt section of America isn't what it was because it used to be a patch quilt of small farms that worked together to produce our food and now it's owned by a handful of corporations. And so for me that's kind of the story. You see the real fallout like Frank who has those birds out. No no other farmer in America has birds out. You know it's less than one percent. So 99 percent of all your turkey and chicken comes from factory farms and he's trying to keep something alive that was uh, in existence 50 years ago. It wasn't even that long ago. So that's something that um, we kind of engaged about, like, let's, let's stay close to the characters, like Frank, and there's a handful of others. There's a government whistleblower that we follow. And through that, you start to see these stories of people's lives unraveling because we want to have very inexpensive meat. You know, we want the 99 cent <coughs> burger. But if you actually tally up the burger, you know, that burger actually cost somewhere between, you know, 50 to a hundred dollars when you, you look at the subsidies, you look at the health, uh, fallout, the cost. And so it's a quite a expensive burger and, it, but it comes very cheaply to us. But in the end we pay in so many other ways. So it's a kind of a fascinating story. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
How do you suggest that young filmmakers get started, like make their name or get started making films? Well, I'll let you speak to that more because you're you're closer to it than uh, I, you know, again, I think it's the persistence. I think you really want to figure out and stay focused on what it is that you want to do. That's the hardest part. So I always loved films and I loved watching, you know, anything. Uh, so it was a hard challenge to figure out what specifically I wanted to do. Uh, and documentaries was kind of the one that I always ended up gravitating toward. And so that, and that took, you know, a number of years to figure that out. But once I did, I just, you know, I knew that's what I had to do. And I found jobs that would support me making my own projects. And that's kind of what you want to do is always take a job. I think I said to you was, you know, get some experience, like go in and, and Hannah asks, where's the best place? And I said, in the edit, because you learn how films are put together. So, you know, she ended up, you know, first interning in the edit and then ended up, you know, really kind of playing a huge part in finishing the film. So there's all these different ways, but I mean, I think you can probably speak to about it because you've been thinking about it a lot since coming out of school. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, the two, the two biggest things for me, which definitely started with TC, was finding a community. And now it's still, I'm, you know, I'm not that far out of TC, so it's still a challenge to find yeah. those people. But I think, and Christopher's a great, you know, uh, example of this, of like when you find your group, it just changes everything and you can do, it's great, it, it makes such a difference. But I think also the big thing for me was getting in and interning, I did a couple different internships and just getting in anywhere and learning from people and kind of just asking questions and being curious and open and reaching out to people. I mean, it makes such a, it makes such a difference. Well, and, and then, you know, you were driving, what, 100 miles to get to, yeah. to come to work, you know, and who would do that? You know, that's, it's like in the morning having to get, go through LA traffic to get, but that's the kind of persistence I think we're talking about. And anything that comes your way, that opportunity, take it and learn from it. But also kind of, I always, the, the great thing that keeps you kind of going is that you have your own projects, your own scripts or your own ideas. And you have to nurture them along. And there's nobody that's going to do it except for you. And once you get that kind of, you know, that desire to do it, you, the persistence is everything. I think once, if you're a creative person, clearly you guys all are, you're here working within, uh, you know, this program, it's stay true to the ideas that you want to make and really l work on them and lay them out and don't take no for an answer. Because there's a lot, just like in general, life will throw you a lot of no's and you have to just have that kind of ability to kind of persist and get through it. And it seems like a tremendous amount of work, but on the other end, it's like, you know, God grew tired of us, got shown all around the world and is taught in schools in Hong Kong and, and here in the United States. And so it's a real, it just feels like, the, you know, the ability to get it to that place, it, it's, it's incredibly worthwhile. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so first I want to thank you guys for coming here. Like, at like the point that I'm at now, I feel like I'm right where you guys were, like while you're going to TC. So like, I'm really like into film, and I feel like I'm at a point where I like like to like plan a lot, and I don't do enough like carrying out. So what do you think like the the good like middle for planning versus like carrying out what you want to do. I see. I think I'm I'm very much a similar person, and actually we've been talking a lot about this because now that this film is done, we're kind of talking about all you know, so many <coughs> options, and it's such a difficult thing to balance kind of the excitement of planning versus yeah. okay, now I have to do all of the work and yeah. I have to find people and all yeah. of this stuff. Um, but that's what makes the difference. That's what makes you know, everyone can plan and everything, but it's the people who can persevere and can carry through. And sometimes you just kind of have to latch on to something. And again, it goes back to making mistakes, especially at the age that you are. It's so 
great and difficult and wonderful to be able to just make something. Maybe it's terrible, but then you learn something and can hop on your next idea. And you know th that is a it's a it's what you say is I you you s I still get caught in that same place exactly where you are. What I think the idea is, um, I remember I had a professor. I went to a, a school called the Anthropology Film Center. And I remember something important. He said, always have six or seven projects going. Because, you know, and uh, it sounds overwhelming, but you can just work on them and figure them out. And the one that really is meaningful to you will rise up, and you can end up with in, a, in a place where you can, you know, nurture that project along. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, you have to kind of figure out what idea it is that you really want to do and kind of put it and highlight it and make it, you, you, you have to kind of, like what I do is I go out and film. So I, you know, got to a place where I could afford buying my own cameras and I would go out and I would just start filming bits and pieces or I'd go out and meet somebody and I would commit to that idea and then I would bring somebody else in, like an editor or a friend and say, what do you think of this? And then it would start, the gears would start to move and you, pretty soon find yourself like, okay, so we don't have all the money for this, which is always with documentary. But you've, you're, you build up enough trust within this group of people and also within yourself to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to get the money to get us to shoot this next scene. And that process can be really difficult because you, you want to give up a lot. But not giving up is the whole thing and the upswing. And I, I remember with God Grew Tired of Us, I was, I think, <coughs> like $40,000 in debt, and I, nobody was buying my film. And I remember I went to see Hotel Rwanda, you know, another film that was similar to this. Um, and uh, I was uh, coming out, and I was like, well, I had to close my edit down, and here's, I've worked three years, and the film is a failure. And while I was in the, f my phone was going off, buzzing a lot. And it was my friend here, uh, Dermot Mulroney, who was actually did, went through the whole TC, became an actor and everything. And he knew kind of the place I was in and was making calls out to people to try and get the money so the film could keep going. And he called and he said, hey, I just talked to Brad Pitt, who really likes the idea of making uh, help supporting your film. He's like, can you send it to him? So I sent it to him, went out and met him, and then the film, he, he's like, how much do you need? And I, I, you know, it's a, it's one of those crazy things, but we were at the end of our rope, and I was financially, uh, and then all of a sudden, you get these, like, kind of reversal of fortunes. That happen all the time, but I think sometimes they're meant to happen, you know, as long as you're persistent. That's like calling all your friends and saying, you're figuring a way out how to make the first scene of your film and just doing it and you know by hook or crook you got to figure out a way and I think that's true with anything you do whether it's television or documentary or now you know podcasting which you're you're producing one now you just and it's equally as hard isn't it right yeah yeah I mean just just persistence it it makes such a difference for sure or organi organize your projects and just put them in on your on your computer or whatever and just make make them meaningful to you. I always put uh, line them up. So I, my first set, like I have probably 40 in this database and then I put seven up there that really are the ones that I focus and I put them in bold. And I try and spend every day at least digging in and looking at them. And then one kind of becomes the next one. And then it gets, you know, 80% of my attention. But I always kind of keep that, I, all those ideas going. And, you know, getting up and reading uh, the newspaper or going online and figuring out a project and always socking them away and writing them. That's what happened here. I read about this in Newsweek magazine. And I was like, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? This is kind of, re and from that, the gears started to roll and I figured out, you know, who, you know, there's somebody who donated some money so I could get to Africa to start making the, the beginning of the film anyway. So it's, it's that process and you, you should trust it because it can lead to really great things. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. <coughs> Hello. I wonder why the, um, making, uh, I forgot the name. Uh, 
Africa. Why Africa? Oh, why? God grew tired of us. Yeah. Why focus on that? So when I, uh, so I, when I was in TC, uh, you know, again, journalism was a big thing. And then CB, when I w started working at CBS, I kind of learned from a lot of old, old guys who were like saying, you know, kind of news journalism, journalism isn't what it used to be. So you should figure out ways of making projects uh, outside of it. They were pretty down on television, document, you know, long form or kind of good journalism in kind of television. Uh, that's an argument. I mean, we could, but I started uh, in that process and I just became uh, enamored with what wasn't being reported in news. And one of the things that wasn't being reported at, the, at that time was all the conflicts that were taking place in Africa. Simultaneously, I went to uh, VCU, which at the time, I think that was the only film program in state. I think it was. But uh, I minored in African American studies, and that became very influential to me. Uh, I had, th like you had great teachers here, and that's, uh, I had some really incredible teachers within that program that kind of influenced me in a, in a way. And looking out, about what was taking place in Africa it just became something that I would read all the time. I would pick up the nation and read it about Africa. And it was something that was really important to me. And when Rwanda happened, it just seemed ridiculous that 800,000 people were, you know, systematically murdered. And we were like not even reporting it about, about it in, in the United States. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, human rights, which I'm a big believer in, but also there's something that, this is a theme, so it's going back to kind of what you were asking. It's about like an idea that is important to you and people being displaced. There's more displaced people on earth than ever before in history. So more people are away from their home and once they leave their home, the chances of them returning home are very unlikely and they spend somewhere between 15 to 17 years away from their homeland. So it's something that is still ongoing and it's something that I really believe that we should at least give the rights to people to a safe home. And Syria is taking place, and there's so much destruction that's taking place there. It's an ongoing thing that I think we should be focused on more collectively. So that's just a personal, personal thing of mine. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, so, what were your guys' financial struggles? Um, they are always well for documentary. So it's different. So I, I like if I worked on, I, I did like a National Geographic hour long, you know, and I go to and make make a documentary for them. I get enough money, and then I would take my, you know, living in New York is expensive, so I wouldn't have a lot of money left, but I would take that money and I would put it towards the project. But I had to stop and start so many times. So that was always a frustration. It's not like somebody just gives you a big lump of money <coughs> and you can go off and make the film. Um, it's, it's always kind of a constant algorithm of how you can make your life work and also make the project, advance the project along. And you figure it out and you stumble along the way. Like I, I dumped uh, you know, all my efforts in and got into some real financial you know, struggles with uh, my first feature. And with this one too, it's no different. I think you just end up, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you're, you're, you have to be willing to kind of struggle financially to, to make the film happen. And sometimes you do things that uh, most people wouldn't do, like put yourself at financial risk for a film that, you know, you haven't sold or, uh, but it's day to day. I finally found a good balance. So like I do television commercials. I'm in a place that you know, I worked really hard to get there, but now I can make, I just finished doing the anti-smoking campaign, um, which I do every year, and I do four or five of them. And the money in commercial production, this is the thing about balance, is like I do a Microsoft commercial and I do a com you know, commercial for you know, uh, CVS and all of those things kind of, you, and they pay you incredible sums of money to do this in a short amount of time. And then once you get that money, 
you can turn it into a project. So the whole way that I jumpstart, like my next project, is based on I just did you know five commercial spots, and I just bought a new cam, updated my camera and got a new camera, and I'm going to go back out and start the whole process over again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know, you well, can yeah, forward. just well, I'm. It's a little bit more difficult because I'm not a producer. I, I haven't <coughs> really seen that side, but I think all documentaries. I don't know any documentary director who's only making documentaries. Usually, they're on a commercial or a TV. Or documentaries are very difficult to make financially. And eating animals. You, they were the producers were fundraising the entire time. You know, four years that we were making it, they were fundraising the entire time. So it's definitely financially very, very difficult to make uh, documentary films, but it's absolutely worth it. And, and possible. You just have to be willing to put 70% of your time into raising money and then taking the other 30% and getting the film you know, out there or advancing it forward. But a good question. It's one that, I mean, that's w if you're going to make anything, even if it's going to be, if you're like sci-fi or whatever you want to make, it's, it's, that's going to be there. Nobody's going to believe in your project. You're the one that's going to have to advance it along. But it really, I, I, you know, you find that balance. And, and doing commercials I love because it's like I've spent three weeks working really hard on something that what you guys are doing here, but on a, you know, a crew of 80 people, you know. And it's, it's fun. I love, I love doing it. You have to love what you do. You know, that's a, that's a big one. Hello, so I'm pretty sure that many people in this room right now are aspiring to work in the filmmaking industry in the future. So what should our next step be? Well, I mean, if you're going uh, to, there's t it's kind of a two ways of going about it. You went uh, and studied, you know, at Pitzer College and studied film all the way through. I did that uh, at VCU and then, you know, did graduate work. So getting into a good school that will teach you kind of the skills. But I learned half of what I learned in school, maybe a little bit less. Most of it was I found a way to start working on projects. Even if I was a PA or a production assistant on a, on a shoot, I would get in there and I would learn as much as I could. Um, so I would say, you know, education's huge, but also find a way to you know, there's a film office in Virginia and D.C., and I would, you know, meet somebody in the film office and say, look, I live in Alexandria. If there's ever anything, I'll intern or work for free and get your foot in the door, and then you meet somebody. And from that, I remember my first job out, out of college, and I was a PA. I was getting paid the minimal scale of working on a uh, commercial, and I could wrap cable really well and fast. And that's what's so funny because we were, we were talking about that back there. But I could properly wrap cable. And the guy who owns the grip truck, the grip and electric truck, saw me wrap cable. And he said, you wrap cable really well. Where did you learn to do that? And I said, at school. And uh, he said, well, I got a job next week. So I spent one day being a PA. And then because I was educated and ready, uh, I knew how to wrap cable. I started working as a grip, and then pretty soon that led. I worked on in Armageddon, and I worked on Contact, and all these big films that came to D.C., and I was one of 300 people. But I made myself, you know, I made an impression. I got in the door, and I worked hard to make sure I stayed there. And eventually, I was the dolly grip. So I got to work with some of, you know, like some really great uh Filmmakers like Zemeckis, you know, and making contact. I was I was there while he was blocking the shots, you know, and Matthew M McConaughey and and uh, Jodie Foster, and doing the whole thing. And I was learning while I was behind the dolly. And I was 25, so I was really young to be. Most dolly grips are about 50, and but I was really good, and I listened, and I always had my ears. and And that's how you can kind of, you just need to get that first in and then take advantage of it and over deliver. A little bit like what Hannah did when she came to me. She was like, it was just an hour long meeting and then she's like, here's how I think, this is why you, I should work for you, you know? And be persistent and find that opportunity. 
And I'm sure, Hannah, you can probably speak to that really well. Yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing is that you guys are probably five million steps ahead of everybody else your age, just having access to the studio and Mrs. Efron and the equipment. And especially today with digital, I mean, I grew up with digital too, just the access and the ability to make things that out of, I was talking to one of your teachers and there was a student who I think graduated a couple years after me uh, who knew After Effects and got a job immediately after high school. And so, I mean, you, there's so much set up here and you could have a full reel and I think it would be very easy for you guys to get hired straight out of uh, high school. And, and like Christopher said, most of the stuff that you learn will be on sets, will be with other people, will be in jobs. Absolutely, an education is important and great, but when it comes to building your community and starting to learn this stuff, getting yourself out onto sets and with people, it's, it's great. It makes a difference. And those early opportunities are ones that you have to maximize. And you'll see, you'll get a job, I'm sure. Uh, you'll start working on a production. Somebody's going to gravitate towards you and say, hey, I have another job, and, and it starts to roll. The, the important thing is all these, the skill set is like even if the small thing like wrapping cable, like I was saying, turns out to pay off in big ways, you know, it's so everything that you kind of retain and learn and become really good at it, uh, that's, that's a big part of it. The other part is being uh, your own ambassador. You have to have the confidence. You go in and know yourself well enough to be the best representative uh, for you and that stuff pays off just being a person that's willing to do anything and everything and be a t you know it sounds trite but be a team player especially in production because everything's so intense there's a li limited amount of time a lot of money being spent and everybody's working at a very fast pace but if you can make yourself be seen and known and indispensable I would say then that's the best uh, thing you can give yourself once you get one of those opportunities. Yeah, just add one more thing, which is what you said at the end, is to make yourself essential is so, and, it, and it's by doing anything. I mean, there's nothing, there's so much going on and all the little things, just volunteer for everything and be, be seen, be active in every part and that's what makes a difference. Yeah, so Hannah was in the edit and she was working with, you know, seasoned editors that are, you know, 50 and 60 years old and so, doing the work, but she made herself present in the decision-making process because she knew the material so well. So she got herself in with, I was out filming, they were ingesting it into the edit, and she was logging and transcribing, which we all have done, it's really boring, <laughs> but getting to know where everything is, and so she made herself indispensable. Because when I would say, where's the shot of when we were in India in the High Atlas, or in the Nilgiris, and she would know it right away. And so then I ended up just, I bypassed my editors because I knew Hannah would know where the stuff is. And I was like, then send it to the editors. And see, she linked herself in as an essential part of getting the film done. And that's why, you know, she advanced from assistant editor to, to becoming an editor on the film. And worked with somebody who's legendary. Like my other editor was Mary Lampson who is you know in the documentary world is storied she she did the groundbreaking film um you know harlan county usa and uh the weather underground so she's like long established and here's somebody well yeah younger. what you, much younger <laughs> and you guys are great friends yeah. now yeah. and then i'm you know mary next project mary's on i'm sure hannah is, is going to be a part of that Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone have another question? I like all the questions. I know, it's a good question. Can't lower it. <laughs> Just tilt it down a little bit. Um, so what was it like going to Africa to film Why God Gave Up on Us? Uh, it was so we had to we had to get permission believe it or not from the government uh, at the time it was uh, area that people were, there was a lot of guns and there was violence and 
So we had to submit to the State Department. And at the time, it just went from Clinton administration to Bush administration. And we were like, there's no way. So we had to wait three months. And we kept calling and calling. And for some reason, they let us go. Uh, and we ended up having to you know, take a fly into to Kenya. Uh, and then we took a transport, this old wobbly plane, all the way up into the middle of nowhere, and it scrub landed on a, on a dirt field. <laughs> and there we were. We had our crew, uh, you know, again, we, I think all told we were four, four or five people. And we had all of our gear. Uh, and then we had to figure out how to get the gear and find, we took shelter at the UNHCR, that's the High Commissioner for Refugees. And they gave us a cinder block like a uh, place to put all of our gear and that's where we slept too. Uh, there were no showers, no, so you, you know, spent a month, you know, and it was dry. And so you had to kind of condition yourself and as I, I did a lot of that stuff for National Geographic, you know, you get about that much water a day, you ration your water and you have to figure out ways of eating, you lose a tremendous amount of weight. Uh, and, but you're surrounded by people who are on a starvation diet to begin with and people who are dying on a daily basis in this camp. So your reality starts to change immediately and you have to kind of adapt to that reality. The funny thing is, is like coming back and then you're, you're in that reality and you come back to New York City and everything's busy. And I bumped into my friend, I remember, and, I was, and she just had gone shopping and she had all this stuff and I was like, I just came from a place where they were rationing grains of rice out for people. So it was a really hard, and I think a lot, you have kind of like this post-trauma after you see a lot of things. And so you don't return back to your regular way of life for months. It takes two or three months. So it's a challenge, but I also love knowing what's happening in the world. I'm willing to kind of live in a tent and be in you know, the high Atlas Mountains of Morocco for a month because that's, I mean, I, I love it. You know, it's what, what I would, I love the experience of learning from other people. Thank you. One more, one more question if anybody has one more question. Anybody? Um, how do you find inspiration to make like your films? and your projects? Yeah. Um, I think I read, uh, you know, like I said, I pull out the newspapers. Uh, newspapers, I go online now. Who am I kidding? There's no newspapers. But I, I read about uh, things. And if something really catches me, I, uh, I'll save it. And, uh, and then the next day, if, it's still, uh, if I'm still thinking about it, I read more about it and I develop it that way and those ideas I'm kind of in a place right now where I'm gonna make another film I have seven of these projects and I'm trying to find which ones gonna kind of surface uh, but it can be anything it just takes a moment to read something or hear something and then you're like I want to make I want to learn more about that uh, I would say and a lot of times you can convince yourself not to do it but if you really have something that really matters to you and you want to, or if it's like a film that you go and see and it inspires you, then, and you want to make something like it, then you've got to figure a way to, to, you know, get to the next step. It's just, it's all incremental. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. But if you have a really good idea, and you probably have some, right, you, you should just develop them. The develop process is, is free. And you can also like spend a lot of time on it, but give yourself a benchmark of like by this time I want to have all this finished, and then I'm going to shoot a scene, and I'm going to get my friends together. You do this in New York, you, a collective of filmmakers, and they go out and they make projects together. So it's there's any and you you guys all have the talent to put on television production. So you could in this room alone have enough people to make something happen which is what we did all the time, you know. Hell High School, 1983. Um, uh, so 
I guess mine mostly comes from friends. I, uh, I have a great story from when I was in class with Mrs. Efron, and she said, uh, you know, I was making a bunch of stuff. She's like, great, it's fine, but you need to go out and live and have experiences, and then you can make even better stuff. And I've always remembered that, and it's just about, you know, getting out there and reading and finding different things, and that's, you, you always find inspiration that way. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you guys have been a fantastic audience. Really, really good. And thank you so much, Chris and Thanks. Thanks Hannah, for, for coming. Yeah. And I guess we're, we're finished then. All right. Thank you. Give a round of applause.